All right, good afternoon. Welcome to our um, very, very interesting virtual event on coronavirus with Dr. Richard Kopeck. He is our CTC microbiology professor here on uh, Central Campus, and he is going to be talking today about um, a lot of information. Before we get started, if you someone asks you to go ahead and register for attendance, make sure that when you're done with this presentation that you go to the library website and hit events, and you can go ahead. There's an online registration. Also, um, you can see other events that we have coming on. But that's enough about me. We are going to get started. Welcome, Dr. Kopech, and take it away. Well, thank you very much, and it's great to be here, and it's certainly great to, uh, that uh, everyone else is here uh, watching this uh, video. So I'm uh, very excited about this. I want to give a little talk today uh, about a video I did in the summer, which uh, I tentatively entitled uh, the potential pre-exposure of prophylactic, prophylactic strategies for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and basically this summer, I was thinking about the kinds of things one could do to uh, either uh, uh, protect yourself from this particular virus uh, or uh, to at least attenuate the effects of the virus, that is to say, to uh, ensure that you have an asymptomatic or a very mild disease if you are uh, exposed and infected by this particular virus. Now, pre-exposure prophylaxis in microbiology is a pretty well-developed concept. For example, with HIV, which causes AIDS, there's something called pre-exposure prophylaxis, and it involves taking a, one pill every day. It's called Truvada. It's, uh, it's composed of tenofovir and uh, m -tri something or other. I kind of forgot the name of that. It's uh, m -tri uh, And if you take that every day, your chances of, of contracting HIV uh, sexually is like uh, reduced by 99%. So this is, this is uh, really quite impressive it's clear that you can reduce the likelihood of contracting various viral diseases by taking certain kinds of compounds and uh, doing certain kinds of things. And so what would be the most likely sort of compounds that you could take to protect yourself against this particular virus or the kinds of behavioral strategies that you could do to protect yourself from this virus. That was what I was interested in this summer, so I made a little video on it. Now I say a little video, it's actually an hour and 42 minutes long and I don't wanna show the entire video here tonight because nobody would stay to the end. But I do have some excerpts from it to give you a flavor for, uh, uh, give you an idea of what's in the video and for those of you who are intensely interested in uh, you can certainly um, uh, access the video and watch the entire thing. So uh, with this in mind, let's watch the, the first segment here. The first segment is about uh, the uh, virion ultra structure, some basic stuff on viruses, uh, the six foot rule, which is again, again a, a kind of a strategy to protect yourself from being infected by the virus. And then finally, some stuff on LD50 and um, uh, ID50s, which is an important concept. So let's let's look at our first the segment. Thank 
Excuse me, I, I'm going to go ahead and start back on that because somehow we got unmuted. We're good. Just keep going. Um, Cindy, um, we haven't have been able to hear the video this whole time. You can't hear the video? No, um, we hear Dr. Felix in the background on just the video itself. Okay, Dr. Kopek, if you wouldn't mind hitting me, and we'll go ahead and go do it again. <laughs> the what now? The what now? The mute. Oh, hit mute? Oh, hit mute? Yes, if you will hit mute. Did you hear any of it? No, we didn't hear any of the video. It's quiet. Like, it's just, you know, it's all. Like, you know, 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 like, you And we can't see it anymore. <laughs>
which is an enormously huge molecule surrounded by the first and then uh, I still can't really hear it. It's very really 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 can't make more anything. Surrounded by an endorph. No, it is an endorph. So an endorph is actually part of the cell membrane. So here's my viral capture, this protein case that they captured the ocean uh, using the uh, monkeys, the cells using the nucleic acid. And some viruses in the cell eye of a cell see a little bit of this membrane. So typically what a virus does is it makes a bunch of protein and sticks the protein into the membrane and then it spreads out this uh, Dual membrane, some of the protein sticking out as white. And this is exactly what a protein tube does. So, a protein tube is just a spike in a membrane. So, what's a membrane? You know, when I draw a cell, I say I draw a cell like that, or the nucleus, you think it's a stick cell. But what is this line? That line is where it's also with a cell membrane. A virus, so you think of protein. The member. And so <clears throat> this is a fairly delicate thin bilayer that you can see right over the molecule. And it's maybe 10 minutes. Cindy, it's not working. Cindy, I can't work. Because I don't think the video is going to leave. The video is going to leave. You can't hear anything you it's the pillows over again. Okay. Well, maybe you can just go ahead and give us a um. <laughs> Just tell us about it, Dr. Kovac, because <laughs> for some reason the video is not cooperating. Okay. So, okay. Could you just please just tell us, and I will mute myself and give you the floor. Okay. Well, that, okay, well that's a pleasant surprise. That's a pleasant surprise. <laughs> uh, uh, basically, that particular segment was about some of the viral ultrastructure uh, viruses are essentially little pieces of nucleic acid. In the case of SARS-CoV, it's actually uh, one long piece of uh, RNA, uh, ribonucleic acid, and it's uh, encased in a, a protein shell, and then around it, there's an envelope. This is actually a, a phospholipid bilayer that it steals from the cell, and then it buds out of the cell and it can infect uh, other cells. The interesting thing about the envelope is that envelope viruses are pretty easy to disinfect. That envelope is only about 10, uh, 10 nanometers in thickness. So there are plenty of, um, uh, of uh, disinfectants that'll go after it. Uh, so, so that's one nice thing about this virus in terms of not getting it. Uh, the other notion is this six-foot rule. Now, right now, I'm talking to you, and uh, although you probably don't know it, uh, just by looking at my little picture there, and I, I don't know how big my picture is. I see a little teeny tiny picture uh, in my screen. But the thing is, I'm emitting all kinds of particles from my mouth, and they're of various sizes. Um, they range anywhere from maybe 100 micrometers in diameter or even bigger. In other words, you could see these things. And if you've ever talked to someone who's kind of uh, juicy, if you know what I mean, you can actually feel the, the, the spittle, if that's what the word is, uh, uh, on you uh, when that happens occasionally. But uh, everyone uh, will emit particles, and some of those particles are really tiny, like less than five micrometers in diameter. If they're, uh, uh, if they're less than five micrometers in diameter, the effect of gravity on them is largely negligible and they can remain in the air for hours, you know, maybe three, four hours, and they can travel great distances. They could go, uh, if, they, if they get caught on a current of air, they could go for, you know, many, many meters. Uh, 
for larger particles, we're thinking that the virus exists in larger titers. That is to say, there's more virus in, in a large particle than a small one. So you're more likely to get uh, infected by the virus if someone is, is close to you because that the reach of those large particles greater than five micrometers is about six feet. And so they fall out of the uh, air uh, pretty quickly they're subjected to gravity and uh, therefore this leads us to the six foot rule and the idea that you should wear a mask because uh, uh, the big particles were thought to basically transmit uh, uh, most of the virus and so you want to stay away from those and that does make sense now other countries like sweden and so on actually don't uh, require masks and uh, their uh, their infection rate uh, hospital case rate and so on uh, is is reasonably low i mean compared to france or england at, at least it is so you know it's really not clear what the effect of that is the other thing is those small uh particles may transmit the virus you just don't know uh there's certainly evidence that that's the case now this is important because there's something called ld50 and id50 and let me talk about ld50 because that's an important concept um, the LD50 is a lethal dose in which 50% of your test animals will develop uh, uh, an, an infection and die from it. In other words, as you increase your infectious dose, as you challenge test animals with more and more virus, of course, more and more it will come down with it, but more and more will die from it. The severity of the disease is a direct function of the uh, of the amount of infectious dose you're giving these animals. It's all animal studies, of course. And, and so uh, the, the, the thing is you want to avoid big doses of it because in the news there, there's uh, news accounts of doctors who treat patients and they're relatively young and they get it and die. And presumably because that's their infectious dose is so high. Now, associated with that idea is this notion that, that uh, 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 you can actually vaccinate yourself, a kind of vaccination, with low doses of the pathogen. There used to be something in microbiology called variolation. Now, variolation is a, an old concept that dates from the time of smallpox. Smallpox doesn't exist anymore. <clears throat> smallpox was a brood of a disease. It, uh, it was uh, highly transmissible, highly contagious. People got it. You got horrible poxy pustules all over your body, and about a third of all people died. So uh, uh, it, very, very bad. It was eliminated due to public health measures and vaccines. But in the old days before generous vaccine, what they did was they would take teeny tiny amounts from pustules and intentionally inoculate people who didn't have the disease, but with a very tiny amount. And the notion was that they would get a mild form of smallpox and therefore be immune. So if you can limit your exposure to this particular uh, pathogen, then the idea is that uh, A, you'll get a much milder, it, you'll be asymptomatic or the disease will be very mild, and you might even be able to immunize yourself in that way. So this notion of a six foot rule, don't get a big dose, don't be around people who are sick and coughing uh, is a uh, reasonable notion. And uh, I think it's a reasonable, pro reasonable prophylactic uh, strategy, social distancing and the, uh, the mask. However, you know, I'm not like, uh, I'm not like, uh, 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 it's clear that people still get it, right? Whether, whether you do that or not. So. What I was thinking about in the summer, are there any kind of uh, drugs that I can take that would protect me from it? Uh, like Truvada can protect you against getting HIV infections. And more to the point, are there any over-the-counter medications? Because you know you can't, uh, can't go to a doctor and say, well, give me all this stuff because I think it's a good idea. You're not gonna get a prescription for that. So are there over-the-counter things that you can do? And I went to the research and if we could only show my little video there, I could show you some of the, some of the uh, scientific papers that uh, this, uh, these notions are based upon. But there is, I mean, there, there are compounds that you can go out and buy on Amazon or eBay or at Walmart, 
and they do have antiviral properties and they may, they just may protect you from uh, uh, developing uh, this virus of getting the disease and ultimately dying from it. So uh, I wanted to identify, you know, some of those, some of those compounds and maybe even take them myself because I'm not crazy about getting this disease, uh, especially at my age. So uh, the, uh, the compounds I became interested in uh, up front were two compounds. One of them is zinc. Now, zinc is a mineral. You can go out to Walmart and buy zinc. It's, uh, you get it naturally from foods and so on. There's a lot in certain uh, seafoods. Uh, oysters, I think, have a lot of zinc. But, but the thing is, uh, if you look at the virus's life cycle, uh, and a cellular cycle. Here's the thing about, about the virus. It's, it, it's an RNA virus and it replicates in our cells, but it uses a special enzyme to make copies of its RNA genome or its RNA uh, 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 genes. And that enzyme is called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Now, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is something we as humans do not have. We don't have that. Uh, so the virus actually has a little gene and it makes and it makes protein and the protein is the RNA dependent RNA polymerase so it can make copies of itself. Well, it turns out that zinc can actually inhibit that process. Z this enzyme is sensitive to uh, high, relatively high concentrations of zinc. And if you can get enough zinc into your cells, then uh, you'll inhibit the uh, replication of the virus giving our immune system more time to fight it and so on. So, and plus zinc is historically has all kinds of antiviral properties that that's been known. Uh, if you look at the literature, there's, there's lots of literature, lots of proposed mechanisms, how that happens. So that was a, a, a pretty clear. There's a problem here though. And the problem is how do you get a lot of zinc in your cells? Because the, there's something called uh, homeostasis in biology. This is a very fancy word, and what home homeostasis means is uh, that cells and your body in general try to maintain a certain uh, range of uh, uh, values, uh, a certain concentration of various ions and substances in your blood, in your cells, and so on, and there are feedback mechanisms that ensure that that's the case. If the levels get too high, there are mechanisms that kick in that lower it. If it gets too low, there are mechanisms that kick in that increase it. And uh, all kinds of mechanisms that do that. So our pH in our blood is pretty constant, that kind of thing. Uh, what about zinc? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you can only get so much zinc. If you're deficient in zinc and take it, of course, your zinc levels will go up. But there are compounds that are called zinc ionophores. And zinc ionophores are actually capable of getting extra zinc into your cells so that your zinc levels are uh, increased from what they would normally be. Now, there's an interesting drug that can do that, and that's hydroxychloroquine that our President Trump uh, used to take, and uh, <laughs> the New York Times didn't like that. But the thing is, there are a number of these compounds. And of course, hydroxychloroquine, which is an anti-malarial drug, uh, that's a prescription drug. You can't take it as some unpleasant side effects. But there is something that you can get over the counter that is a zinc ionophore that will that has been shown to increase your your uh, zinc levels, and that's quercetin. That's quercetin. So if you're watching my uh, my video in the future, if you're ever going to do that. And after, you know, uh, but if you're ever going to do that, quercetin, it's a Q U E R C I T I N. And uh, it's cheap. It's, a, it's what's called a, a phenolic compound. It's a bioflavonoid. It's found typically in foods. What kind of foods? Uh, cauliflower, broccoli. Uh, it's found in red onions. It's found in blueberries. You get uh, all kinds, you get probably milligram quantities of this uh, every day. And a little bit more if you, if you eat like your mother told you to eat, you know, your, your vegetables and fruits and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so if you take them together, you can force a little bit more zinc into your cells and 
uh, that should slow the viral replication down. So those are two good candidates for pre-exposure prophylactic compounds that you can go out and buy today. Now, let me just emphasize, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't suggest anyone do this. Uh, I don't give medical advice. I'm a confident fool when it comes to medicine. So uh, please don't take this as uh, some, uh, some recommendation or something that you should do. Uh, if uh, you're going to take uh, zinc supplements, well, you can go out and buy them. They're not that dangerous, but huge amounts of zinc uh, are, are, are uh, not good for you, Bill. The, they have unpleasant side effects. There's an upper tolerable limit for zinc. I think it's like maybe 40, 45 mic micrograms a day. I think it's micrograms. I'd have to check. Uh, but in any event, it's, well, maybe it's milligrams. I, I forgot. <laughs> I'm doing this a cappella. I'm doing this offhand. And, uh, you know, you guys uh, can't uh, expect uh, world class. Well, we put the link in the comments, Dr. Kopak, so they will be able to see your videos, just not right now while you're talking. So I okay, well, that's, uh, that's reassuring that they can do that. So, anyway, a little bit is good, a lot is not good. Two aspirin will cure your headache. A thousand aspirins will kill you. So uh, please don't think more is better. You know, people always do that, but it's it's uh, it's important not to do that. Anyway, if any, any of your any of you are tempted to take zinc or quercetin or any of this stuff, please see your medical doctor before you before you attempt that. That's my advice. But I'm talking about me and my research, not research, but readings, I guess, over the summer. So, uh, uh, you know, please, please note that. Okay, so zinc and quercetin are good candidates, right? They are. Uh, are there any other ca uh, candidates? So I was thinking about quercetin, and quercetin is a bioflavonoid, it's polyphenolic. What about other polyphenolics? There's a real famous one that leapt to mind, and that's resveratrol. Now, resveratrol, you may have heard of it. It supposedly has anti-aging properties. It... Uh, uh, resveratrol is uh, is thought to delay the onset of various degenerative diseases. At least that's true in mice. <laughs> so if we were mice, it would be the thing to take. Uh, it's commercially available. It's cheap, and uh, it occurs naturally. As a matter of fact, you can uh, if you drink wine. I think there's about 0.27 micrograms of that in wine and uh, red wine at least, good red wine. <laughs> so I'll go home tonight and have a, a nice glass of red wine after this um, to relax. But, uh, you know, it, it is, it is a, a, a nice compound and it can't be that toxic because, uh, you know, I drink a lot of red wine and here I am. So anyway, uh, resveratrol. So uh, if I looked in the literature and that has all kinds of antiviral properties, it has antiviral properties uh, and it's been shown to inhibit uh, things like Epstein-Barr virus, enterovirus, herpes simplex virus, the uh, influenza virus, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, it does. And, and there's a recent uh, preprint article that's available now where they uh, study the effect of resveratrol on SARS-CoV-2. And yeah, it does have activity against it. So um, it's a, a compound that's also a prime candidate for pre-exposure prophylaxis, as I call it. Um, okay, so, so those are really, really interesting, interesting compounds. Are there any other compounds? Well, there's, there's a couple, uh, and I'll immediately mention vitamin C. But why vitamin C? Well, vitamin C has all kinds of uh, immune functions. That's clear. If you don't get enough vitamin C, you get scurvy, for goodness sake. And scurvy means your teeth fall out, you get easy bruising, and you get all kinds of infections because your immune system collapses. But the thing is, the big amounts count. I mean, uh, we know that if you have enough vitamin C, that doesn't happen. Uh, do large amounts help you? Uh, there's evidence that goes both ways. The thing about vitamin C, though, is that it helps you absorb quercetin because quercetin normally in foods is connected to a little glucose, little uh, 
a little glucose molecule. It's, it's, it's glycosylated, and that helps you absorb it. Without that, these uh, polyphenolic compounds are very difficult to absorb. So um, if you take vitamin C, that supposedly helps you, uh, helps you absorb it. And uh, so I do take vitamin C because of that. And there is evidence that they work synergistically too, by the way, because vitamin C can, re, uh, can, uh, can reduce, I guess, quercetin. It can regenerate it because quercetin is also an antioxidant, which I'm not going to go into. <laughs> I'm not. Because I, I, you know, that's, this is, uh, this is off, off the top of my head here, by the way. I, I, I need a little preparation for that. But anyway, okay. How does, how does this thing kill you? How does SARS-CoV-2 kill you? Well, there's a couple of killing mechanisms that are worth mentioning. The premier one is a uh, cytokine storm. So what's a cytokine storm? Well, suppose uh, uh, you touch uh, something really hot and get burned, your finger gets burned. What happens to it? Well, it blisters up and you get all that fluid in a blister, right? And it's hot and it's painful and throbs. That's an inflammation effect. And it's due to the release of certain chemicals and the activation of certain chemicals uh, that are the result of the injury. And this leakiness of your blood vessels and dilation of your blood vessels, uh, this is a good thing because it allows white blood cells to reach the source of the injury and your white blood cells can eat, can eat all of the, um, the bad guys there, eat the dead cells and if there's an infection, you also get inflammation and so on. So it's a good thing, but it's not a good thing when it goes nuts. And this disease can lead to uh, the inflammation of your entire lungs. And so you have to imagine your entire lungs filling with fluid, just like that blister fills with fluid. And proteins leak into the fluid. It turns into a kind of gel. And you can't get gas exchange in the alveoli of the lungs. Uh, and you essentially die from lack of oxygen. In fact, one of the strategies when that happens with uh, SARS-CoV-2 is to shunt your blood to an artificial uh, heart-lung machine, and oxygenate it artificially, and put it back. Except it usually doesn't work, and the guy ends up dead anyway. Okay, so this cytokine storm is a result of a uh, of an immune dysregulation of the inflammatory response there are all kinds of complicated mechanisms that require that your immune system has to to get inflammation but not too much inflammation because too much inflammation can kill you and this seems to the virus seems to screw up that regulation and is there anything that can help with the regulation of your immune response uh, in terms of the cytokine storm? And there's one, and it's dramatic, and it's vitamin D. And vitamin D is, uh, it, 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 your immune cells have vitamin D receptors. Uh, they require vitamin D to, to function properly. If you're low in vitamin D, your immune uh, system is not functioning properly. And so consequently, um, the vitamin D seems to have a real effect in attenuating that storm. Now, there's a, a, a paper out this month, and uh, I wish I could show it to you here, but our video is not working, as you may have heard. There's a, uh, a video, I mean, a, a paper out, uh, um, it's, a, it's from Spain, and what they're doing is they're giving vitamin D to hospitalized patients, okay? And uh, they're giving it in the form of uh, cal calcifidiol, which is activated vitamin D. It's what your liver does to the vitamin D uh, that you take. So if you ever read the paper, you'll see calcifidiol, not vitamin D. But it's the same thing. It is. So they separated at random into groups who were hospitalized, 50 got the vitamin D and 26 didn't get the vitamin D. They were treated with uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, which is standard treatment. But 50 got vitamin D, 26 did not. 
of the 50 who got to uh, got the um, uh, vitamin D, 50 got vitamin D. One of them had to go to the intensive care unit, and nobody died. They were all they were all discharged with no complications. Of the 26 people who did not get vitamin D, 13 had to go to the ICU, and two died. Two of them died. So this is an enormous difference by virtue of uh, you know just giving someone vitamin D, and vitamin D has been shown to uh, 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 prevent flu and attenuate flu. It has a real uh, immunological consequence. So vitamin D is a is a prime candidate. A lot of old people have very low levels of vitamin D, and uh, I do take vitamin D. If you take lots of vitamin D, that's toxic. It's a poison at high concentration, so you don't want to take a lot of vitamin D. More is not better, but uh, 25 micrograms a day is the uh, is the dose for vitamin D. It's sometimes referred to as 10,000 internet. I think it's a thousand international units. Um, so you should do that. <laughs> well, I, I shouldn't say that. I, I don't. I don't recommend anyone do anything. I'm not a doctor, but I do it. And I, I think it's a good idea. It has a real effect. That's a uh, that's a, uh, a good thing, uh, in my opinion, good candidate for pre-exposure prophylaxis, as I call it. Okay, so vitamin D and vitamin C. What else can we say about that? Uh, Pepsi. <laughs> let's let's talk a little bit about Pepsi. Uh, Pepsi is an anti antacid. It is, and uh, the uh, active comp uh, active component of Pepsid is a is a compound called famotidine, and famotidine is a proton pump inhibitor. It uh, inhibits histamine release and so on. They they focused on it by doing a bunch of uh, what they call a in silico research. I'll do that air, air quotes here. And silico research, which is to say, they they looked at the um, the sequence of the um, of the spikes on the virus, and they tried to match it with a bunch of compounds in a computer, and they found some homologies there that predicted the famotidine would bind to it and, or interfere with it. Also, some of the proteins that it made, uh, the proteases especially. And so uh, people started to look at it very carefully, especially after they noted that people who were on it had a much lower uh, uh, hospitalization rate. Well, they, they had a much lower complication rate and they didn't die as often as people who were on these other antacids. And so it became a, an interesting compound, and there are uh, studies about that. And these, statistically, it seems to have a real effect that if you give people thamotidine, it does reduce complication rates. Now, the, uh, the thinking is today it has nothing to do with the virus, as a matter of fact. That's been, they say that that's been more or less disproven. What they do say is that famotidine is a is a, a histamine H2 receptor blocker. I mean, it does that. There's no question that it does that. It's designed to do that. It blocks histamine, but it blocks histamine H2 receptors on mast cells. And by mast, I mean N-A-S-T. Now, mast cells are located throughout your body. They sort of permeate tissue. And what they do is release histamine. And what does histamine do? Well, it causes inflammation. And uh, uh, this is part of the killing mechanism that SARS-CoV-2 has, uh, this dysregulation of the immune control of, of inflammation and then too much inflammation in the lungs, you die. So if you can reduce inflammation with something like famotidine, then maybe that's the mechanism. And people are sort of keying on that mechanism now instead of the other ones. It's possible uh, that that's 
something you could do if you ever get sick and you know i would certainly consider it if i if i was actively ill with it i i wouldn't take it as a pre-exposure prophylaxis because i want to digest my food you know it, to stop stomach acid so you know uh, there's a downside there but nonetheless uh, i would i would certainly seriously consider that okay <laughs> let's continue with this um what else? Nicotine. <laughs> nicotine. So nicotine is peculiar because, you know, uh, they found, especially in France, there's a lot of smokers in France. I think it's like over a quarter of the population smokes for some odd reason. And uh, what they found was that there were very few smokers. There were very, very few smokers uh, actually getting this disease and ending up in, in the hospital. So uh, the notion was, well, maybe it's smoking. Maybe smoking is protective, but this is counterintuitive, of course, because smoking is uh, is always bad for lung infections. Um, but nonetheless, uh, they looked at smoking and especially they looked at nicotine, which is, of course, a component of the smoke. And nicotine, <clears throat> uh, they 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 looked at the so they were looking at nicotine and. One of the things that they noticed when they were looking at the virus spike, because they were trying to, to figure out what was going on here, so they looked at the viral spike proteins. They, they looked at that. And they found that there was a bit of the protein on that spike that was very similar to snake venom, specifically uh, like blue crates and... Indian crates, which are terrible snakes and very, very lethal. But what does that snake venom do? It, it actually binds to uh, acetylcholine receptors on nerve cells. That's what it does. And of course, acetylcholine receptors on nerve cells are involved in neural transmission. And in fact, crate venom will paralyze you. You, you can't breathe and you die. It takes about, I think, a day or something something like that. But anyway, what was I saying? I was, okay, so so what does this have to do with the nicotine? Well, <clears throat> nicotine binds to acetylcholine too. There's something called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and they're called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors because they bind nicotine. And so the thinking is those receptors are protected because when you take nicotine, it binds to the receptor, and this, this blocks the interaction of the virus with the receptor, because they were predicting that because the receptor has a snake-like bit of protein, it would bind to the acetylcholine receptor. We always think of the virus as binding to the ACE2 receptor, ACE2 converting enzyme receptor, and it does. But it interacts with all kinds of other proteins on the surface of cells, like TMPRSS2, which is a protease which activates the, the spike. And apparently, it may be interacting with acetylcholine receptors too. Now, that's pretty interesting because you've probably read where people with this disease uh, might lose their sense of taste or smell. And this is clearly a neural phenomenon. There are are ACE receptors on nerve cells, but uh, you know there are also acetylcholine receptors, so maybe it's doing that, and maybe nicotine can interfere with that process. So, you know, uh, I certainly haven't taken up smoking, and I don't take nicotine, but uh, you know, if you actually were losing your sense of smell and taste. Would I take it, a nicotine? Well, maybe in the form of nicotine patches, which you can buy like on Amazon or uh, uh, you know Walmart sells CVS sells them. They're they're usually like um, um, I I think they're the equivalent. I think there's like 21 milligram patches and 14 and 7 milligram patches. They uh, 21 milligrams is the equivalent of about 10 cigarettes a day. So I don't know how much that is because I don't smoke, but, uh, you know, it's a reasonable amount of nicotine. And is that a reasonable thing to do if you're sick? I don't know. I would certainly talk to my doctor about that 
and uh, ask him. And he'd probably say, are you crazy? Don't do that. But uh, nonetheless, if, uh, you know, again, it's, it's just one of those compounds that's interesting, not so much as pre-exposure prophylaxis, but as a kind of a treatment uh, option if you have a mild case. And, and again, I don't recommend this. Not a doctor. Don't know anything about medicine. But it's something I would be talking to my doctor about if I, if I actually did get this disease. Uh, and there are other things like that as well. Uh, I noticed that President Trump was taking a bunch of stuff. Uh, he was taking, uh, I know he's taking zinc, uh, but he was also taking melatonin, which is a, which is an antioxidant. Uh, in the talk, I, I talk about all kinds of, I talk about, well, I talk about NAC, but I don't want to talk about that here. Um, that's uh, beyond the scope of my impromptu little lecture here on this. Uh, but let me talk about one more thing, because I see I've burned up a little bit of time here. So uh, people have at least got their money's worth. The, uh, the one more thing I want to talk about is hydrotherapy. <laughs> hydrotherapy. So in the early days of, uh, of medicine, this is like 1900s and so on, there was something called hydrotherapy. And what hydrotherapy was, was they would subject you to very hot showers and then very cold showers. In other words, they would, uh, you would have to essentially uh, go into a sauna or, or the, but, but you, would, you were heated up by water, so they called it hydrotherapy. And this, there were a number of regimens uh, of hydrotherapy. So you might have to have cold and then hot and then cold and then hot, cold, hot showers, that kind of thing. And that supposedly was good for you. That supposedly protected you from disease. That was the thinking back then. Well, no one thought about that, you know, for, for the last hundred years, I suppose. But during the great pandemic of 1918, when influenza swept through the country and killed millions of people, uh, they, they, they recently went back and looked at some of these sanitariums, as they were called back then. Uh, today, we think of sanitariums as for crazy people, but back then it was for health reasons. And uh, they found that certain, uh, like uh, the Adventists who ran these sanit uh, sanitariums, who did the hydrotherapy, that their death rate from things like the, the influenza a pandemic of 1918-1919, it was very low. It was like maybe a tenth of what it was out in the general population. And the thinking was, well, maybe it has something to do with hydrotherapy. So, okay. Uh, there are some papers in the last 10 or 15 years looking at the effects of hyperthermia on white blood cell count. And there's certainly some evidence that Th this hyperthermia, increasing your temperature, can increase your white blood cell count. And especially something called natural killer cells and monocytes, which are important in, in uh, SARS-CoV-2. People with low monocyte levels don't do well. And the thing is, this is, uh, this, this, this is reasonable. When you get a fever, this you know, you're getting a fever for a reason, and the the reason is the high temperature activates all kinds of genes, and these genes uh, uh, basically lead to an enhanced immune response. Clearly, you increase interferons and stuff like that. So uh, it's it's a reasonable notion, and the idea that alternating temperatures from hot to cold to hot to cold that sort of dynamizes or enhances or turbocharges that that response for whatever reason so there are these regimens for hydrotherapy there are and uh i'm just trying to think of the time courses offhand i've done a couple you have like maybe 30 seconds of, of a cold shower say and by cold, I mean there's no warm water at all. It's right out of the faucet. So you're talking anywhere from between probably about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 to 70, depending upon time of year. And then three minutes of a really hot shower, maybe like up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. 
which means you're, you're sweating under the water. It's, it's very, very hot. And then back to cold. And then maybe a minute of that or something. And then back to uh, hot and so on. Do that three times and you're ready to stop because it's very unpleasant. But nonetheless, some people argue, and there is evidence that this does increase your white blood cell count and, and activity of the white blood cells. And so that therefore it's a good strategy to uh, do if you want to protect yourself from these uh, from SARS-CoV-2 from from the uh, from the thing. Well, at the end of my talk, I give a little personal note on what I do and, and how I uh, how I manage this stuff. Um, but again, it's just something I personally do as the result of my you know kind of uh, lackadaisical research over the summer. And uh, does it have any effect at all? <clears throat> does it have any effect at all? Well, you know, you don't know, right? I mean, you just don't know. Um, uh, I haven't died of uh, SARS-CoV-2 yet. So, uh, you know, maybe that's a good sign. Um, but it may be very effective. If it may not be very effective at all. It, uh, you know, who knows? But you look at the evidence. I, I think uh, it is probably a... a, a uh, something that does something. So it's something that does something. It, it, it does. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's cheap. It's easy. I, I consider it to be reasonably safe myself, so I do it for me. People are different. They have different medical conditions, and some things I'm sure with certain medical conditions you would not want to do. So if anyone is interested in doing those things after seeing my video, because this is just my talk, I, you know, I'm doing offhand for goodness sake. Please don't uh, judge me on on this basis. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, nonetheless, you know, see a doctor, talk to your doctor about it, and you may want, might want to consider it. So that was essentially the essence of my talk. I have some uh, you know some other bits and pieces there. It goes on for an hour and forty two minutes. I think I've gone on for over half an hour. I think. I, and uh, uh, I will stop there. Uh, and if anyone has any questions about any of this, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. And if not, uh, I hope it, you weren't too disappointed by not seeing the video. And uh, I'll certainly wave goodbye if you're leaving now. But if you're hanging around, I'll hang around and, and try and answer the question. Well, um, you know that um, we did put your links in the comments so they can go ahead and see the videos. Um, we will let us know if we have any questions. Um, it's just good to know that eating your fruits and vegetables with your vitamin C and all your uh, antioxidants and your blueberries and uh, vitamin D, your sunshine, those things which are good for you, not too much, is sounds like it's really helpful in this. So Lee, do, were there any comment, any questions in the comments? Um, no, there's not any right now. No, there's not any right now. Okay, well, um, Dr. Kopek, we apologize that our video wouldn't come through loud enough for everyone, but that was an amazing, um, Amazing information. You truly can't believe it, uh, that we've learned so much. If we get any comments in our comment section, we will definitely forward them to you so that you can go ahead and answer the specific comment. Um, we want to thank you and everyone. Uh, make sure that you check out the video uh, on our. CTC YouTube and our library YouTube and um, maybe we can recommend it and put the links together with all of everything. So we will get it together one way or the other. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Check out our events page because our next event is going to be our workforce solution. Uh, October 19th, 20th, and 21st, and we're going to go ahead and um, have it at 12 15 instead of your normal 12 o'clock. Okay.
So thank you, Dr. Kopech. We really, truly appreciate it. You did wonderful as acapella. Okay. <laughs> Just threw you in there and said, okay, wing it. You did great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, you have a good evening. Okay. okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Don't leave us, Dr. Kopech, yet. Don't leave us.